Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our program today entitled LGBT Religion and Diversity in the Nonprofit Workplace. My name is Jeff Tenenbaum, Chair of the Nonprofit Organizations Practice at the Venable Law Firm. Uh, welcome to our monthly legal program. Uh, as many of you know, this is part of a monthly series of programs that we do here in our DC office every month on a wide array of different nonprofit legal topics uh, with a webcast simulcast from uh, 1230 to 2 o'clock two Eastern time uh, every month. Um, about three and a half years we've been doing these. Uh, very pleased to, uh, to see everyone today. and We have a great crowd of about 200 people dialed in from around the country on the telephone today. Uh, we have a really interesting and, and uh, uh, jam-packed program for you today. Uh, before we get into the, uh, the heart of it, though, let me uh, talk about a few housekeeping matters. Uh, first off, for those of you who are uh, trade and professional association executives, these programs are eligible for CAE continuing education credit. Preview of our uh, next two scheduled programs in January. Uh, our program is entitled Cross-Border Money Transfers, Key Requirements Every U.S.-Based Nonprofit Needs to Know. Uh, this is an, uh, a very important and uh, seemingly uh, growing uh, area in which uh, our uh, nonprofit practice uh, continues to do an increasing amount of work. It's an area we get constant questions from our clients in this area, and we thought it would be a really interesting and helpful program uh, for those of you uh, U.S.-based nonprofits that operate overseas, which is increasingly many. Uh, and then in February, February 18th, our program is entitled One Year Later, Time for Nonprofits to Implement the Super Circular. So for any of you nonprofits that are federal award recipients, grants, contracts, cooperative agreements, uh, as, as you probably well know, the, the super circular is uh, bringing about major changes for federal award recipients, particularly federal grant recipients. Uh, so if you receive federal money or you expect to or hope to receive federal money in the future, this is a program that you're definitely not going to want to miss. A few logistical items. First off, because of the uh, large amount of material we have packed into today's program, we are going to need to hold questions until the end, but we have reserved about 10 minutes at the end of the program if all goes according to plan for questions. Those of you in the room, just raise your hands, and Marianne will walk around with a microphone so that everyone on the phone can hear your questions. And those of you on the webcast, pose your questions uh, to me using the chat feature on the webcast software, and I'll pose those to our speakers at the, uh, at the appropriate times. Uh, handout materials, those of you in the room have a printed handout book that has a copy of the PowerPoint slides, uh, full bios of our speakers, and uh, some related articles. Uh, those of you on the webcast uh, uh, received an email that contains a link to the PowerPoint presentation, and tom tomorrow all of you will receive an email that contains a link to the recording of today's program, the audio recording with the sync PowerPoint presentation, along with the um, uh, PowerPoint and bios and, uh, and related articles. Feel free to share that with colleagues or others who might benefit from the recording of today's program. Uh, we are fortunate today to have uh, three of my colleagues uh, with us today. Yes, it's such an, uh, an important topic that we decided to have three Venable lawyers on the panel today. Uh, these are our three terrific uh, labor and employment and employee benefits lawyers with whom I have the privilege to work. To my far right, Doug Mishkin, the newest member of our team, uh, joined us a few months ago as, as been a, a big hit so far at Venable. He's a, a pleasure to work with. Uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know Doug and, and appreciate uh, everything that he brings uh, to the table as, an as a labor and employment lawyer. Uh, Doug will be starting us off. To, uh, to, to Doug's left is Todd Horn. Uh, Todd is a labor and employment lawyer based primarily in our Baltimore office. Uh, Todd participated in one of these monthly programs a few months ago, some of you might recall, um, and is um, going to be speaking uh, about some of the uh, labor and employment issues uh, uh, specific to today's topic. And then uh, Keith Mong is a member of our, our Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Group based in our D.C. office. Uh, as you might expect, the employee benefits angle here is very important uh, for today's topic, and Keith will be addressing those issues. You can see full bios of our speakers in your handout materials. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Doug to get us started. Doug? Uh, first, let me see a, a quick show of hands. Uh, how many people here are opposed to diversity? <laughs> Ten of put your hand down, please. Of course not, right? Diversity is noble. It's true. It makes our organization stronger. It makes our communities stronger. If that's the case, how can it be that an employee could say, 
in order for me to comply with this diversity policy, I would have to deny my faith. Well, first I'm going to tell you the story of the employee who said that, who sued his employer, and who won. Then I'm going to tell you the story of a second employee who said something roughly like that, and sued and lost. And then we'll address the all-important question, so what? What does this mean for your organization and for what you should be doing? Let me say at the outset, these stories are about beliefs that many people find offensive. There's no way to tell the stories without talking about those beliefs. It's the only way I know of to be able to learn about the issues. Now, diversity as a concept, it's a blessing and a curse. The blessing is obvious. It's an unarguable virtue. You cannot be against it. It's a fact of life. We are diverse. But what's the curse? The curse is if we think everybody's in favor of it, then we get lazy about defining what it is. Right? We assume we all know what the it is that we're referring to, and that leads us to our first story, the story of Mr. B. This comes from a case in Colorado. The facts. Mr. B is a Christian who believes the Bible is divinely inspired because the Bible requires that he treat others as he would like to be treated. He values and respects all other employees as individuals. He never has, nor would he, discriminate against another employee, but his religious beliefs prohibit him from approving values that he believes are repudiated by Scripture. Right? What have we got so far? Treat others as he would be treated. He wouldn't discriminate against somebody else. What could go wrong? Nothing. Until... What's everyone's favorite project in the workplace? That's right, until the company issued its new employee handbook. And the handbook contained this language about its diversity policy. It says, each person is charged with the responsibility to fully recognize, respect, and value the differences among us. Still, where's the problem? I'm going to tell you. Because in disseminating the handbook, the company required each employee to sign a certificate of understanding that the employee will abide by our employment policies and practices. That's the problem? That's the problem. How so? Mr. B was troubled by the sentence I read for you just a moment ago. Each person is charged with the responsibility to value the differences among all of us. Well, what's troubling him? He says his beliefs prohibit him from approving values that are repudiated by the Bible. This guy is genuinely troubled. Right? He goes and he talks to his pastor. Now we're not told from the court decision what goes on in that conversation, but you can just imagine. The pastor says to him, Mr. P., I cannot imagine the company wants you to do something that you think is against scripture. Why don't you go talk to the nice people at work? So he goes and talks to his supervisor, and the supervisor says, uh, I'm not the person to, to sort this out, right? Crisis not yet resolved. Mr. B is getting concerned. He needs some real spiritual guidance. He needs some real wisdom. Where does he go now? That's right, on to human resources. He leaves a note for his HR manager, and he says, I can't comply with this ambiguous statement uh, under the diversity policy. I believe it's wrong to attempt to persuade me uh, to accept and to value any differences which are contrary to God's word. In order for me to comply with this diversity statement, I would have to deny my faith. Right? This note leads to a meeting. So Mr. B and the supervisor meet with the HR manager. 
And HR begins by saying, if you want to keep your job, sign the certificate. So Mr. B says, listen, can you clarify this policy for me? How would it apply, for example, to the beliefs of neo-Nazi skinheads? Now, let me just offer a brilliant legal observation at this point. You know you're in trouble when your employees start using Nazis in their questions, okay? We're now at the critical point in the story because we have an employee who's troubled, right? He's been to his pastor. He's talked to his supervisor. He took the trouble to write a thoughtful note to HR. The situation is teed up for the HR manager. And this is what we want, right? We want our employees bringing us their problems, bringing us their questions, so we get a chance to respond. So how do you think the HR manager responds? Right? How about, Mr. B, I'm delighted that you've brought me your question. Let me explain to you how the diversity policy works, because I think I can show you that there's really no conflict between your beliefs, which we respect, and what we're trying to accomplish with the diversity policy. You think that's what the HR manager said? No, because if the HR manager said that, I'd be back at my seat, right? In fact, what the HR manager says is, I'm not interested in any philosophical debates. Okay, how many people think Mr. B signed the certificate? Of course not. When he, when he didn't get an answer to his question, he refused to sign, he gets fired. Now. Who does he talk to next, right? He'd been to his pastor, he talked to his supervisor, he talked to HR. With this big a problem, there were only two people left he could talk to. He could go to a psychiatrist or he could go to a lawyer. But, you know, those, psychi those psychiatrists are just so expensive. So he goes and talks to a lawyer. You know how this conversation went, right? Mr. B tells him, all of this stuff, and the lawyer says to him, you, know, you mean you told them that your religious beliefs would be offended and they wouldn't even discuss it with you? At this point, the lawyer hands Mr. B the first document that Mr. B is happy to sign, a retainer agreement, right? And he files a lawsuit. And Mr. B's theory is that you violated Title VII because you wouldn't accommodate my religion. And of course, that's the employer's obligation. You've got to make a reasonable accommodation if there is such a thing, unless it would unduly burden you. And the company says, well, you know, we couldn't do that. Now, Mr. B said, this policy is ambiguous. Namely, it can mean at least two different things. Now, one way to interpret it is to say that an employee has to accept differences among employees, but another way to interpret it is to say that an employee must actually value the particular beliefs of other employees, beliefs that this employee doesn't share. Well, that's how Mr. B interpreted the policy, and that's what bothered him. The judge said this policy was, in fact, ambiguous. Why? Because during the trial, five different company officials testified about their understanding of the policy, and that's right, they gave five different understandings. At least that's how the judge heard that testimony. So that was bad enough. But beyond that, the judge said no company official explored what the policy was supposed to mean and Mr. B's concern. They didn't talk to him about his concerns. They didn't assure him that the policy was consistent with his beliefs. It looked like he was being given a choice, sign on to a policy that violates your religious beliefs or get fired. And the judge said, no good. He said Mr. B couldn't comply with the language he was required to sign on to and that because that was asking him to value beliefs that he thought re were repudiated by scripture. And as a result, Mr. B won and got an award of over $140,000.
regardless of what you think about how the judge saw the policy and whether it was ambiguous and all that, let's listen to story number two, the story of Mr. J. So Mr. J goes to work uh, as an engineer and the company's got its handbook. It says it's important you read uh, and comply with this stuff and there's an EEO policy and there's an acknowledgement saying you, the employee, has a responsibility to know and to uh, understand all of this. They tell him that he is to read and sign the acknowledgement. Well, Mr. J goes halfway. He reads it, but he doesn't sign it. He works there for 17 months without having signed. Then company revises the handbook and they say, now you have to sign it. And he refuses. And he says, this policy would violate my firmly held religious beliefs. He says, if I sign it, it basically states I give my stamp of approval to things that the Lord looks at as immoral. Signing it would mean I must comply with sin. And Mr. J left no doubt about it. He told another employee that his concern was about homosexuality. Now, there were actually some discussions, people trying to reconcile the, the objectionable statements, there were meetings, but in the end, he agreed to sign the form, but with reservations. So he added language saying he would comply within God's law, and then said his signature was subject to change at the sole discretion of the signer. I kind of like that. That was, uh, give, him, give him credit for the effort, right? Not surprisingly, Human Resources says, now nah, we don't accept that. Uh, we need you to sign it, and you need to un we need that you understand that you're going to abide by our rules while you're working for us. And Mr. J said, I just couldn't do it. Now, why is this a problem for the company? Uh, HR said, well, his refusal might get us in trouble if he ever violated our EEO policies. That, Kind of makes sense. Imagine the very guy who wouldn't sign your policy then becomes the subject of a complaint. Wouldn't a plaintiff's lawyer like to get their hands on that? So they wind up saying to him, sign it or else. He says no. They say you're fired. And Mr. J, of course, sues for religious discrimination. Now he says, there are three different ways you could have accommodated me. He said, first, you could have let me deviate from the policy and just not sign it. After all, I worked for 17 months without signing it. Second, he says, you could have accepted it with my reservation, namely, I'm agreeing until I change my mind and decide not to agree. And third, you could have had a witness uh, certify that I received the policy. Well, but that wasn't what the acknowledgement was about. And the trial judge said, company wins. These are not reasonable accommodations. Then up on appeal, there's an interesting discussion. The Court of Appeals agreed with the trial judge. The majority did. And the judge who wrote for the majority, Judge Brogan, says, look, this guy was refusing to sign, and that refusal to sign meant that he wanted to be allowed to discriminate based on sexual orientation. But there was a dissent. And Judge Donovan, in dissent, said, look, I know that HR perceived his refusal to sign as a refusal to abide by the non-discrimination policy, but Judge Donovan said, I'm not convinced that the record supports that. And I say the company didn't have sufficient information to know whether there was an actual conflict between the policy and his belief, so you can't know whether there could have been a reasonable accommodation. Now, the judge said something interesting. He said the duty to accommodate sometimes requires that an employee be exempted from an otherwise valid work requirement. Well, that's true, but I'm a little curious what this judge was referring to. Is he suggesting that Mr. J could have been excused from the requirement to work with gays and lesbians? It doesn't make sense. But the judge went on in dissent and said, maybe Mr. J was just talking about beliefs, not conduct. And then the judge found the right case to cite. He says there's an obvious distinction between conduct and belief. What case does he cite? 
our, the case of our friend, Mr. B. He says, there's an obvious distinction between conduct and belief. Like Mr. B, all that Mr. J asks is that he not be forced to endorse views contrary to his religion as a condition of continued employment. Then Judge Donovan said, why don't you just put a piece of paper in front of the guy that says, I shall not discriminate on the basis of race, gender, sexual orientation, and the like. So Judge Donovan says, this guy got terminated for his beliefs, not for his conduct. What's going on here? What's going on is judges are struggling with this. They're struggling to figure out in these cases, is it merely a belief that's at issue? Is it conduct? And by the way, where's the line between the two? Now, I submit to you that either one of those cases could have gone either way. So let's see how this line gets analyzed in a few other stories that I want to share with you quickly before getting to the punchline of so what. Let's try this one out. An article appears in a local paper in which a supervisor in your company discusses his involvement in his church as a reverend. So far we're okay, yes? All right. That church, where the guy is a reverend, promotes white supremacy. So the article discusses the supervisor's involvement in the church, and it discusses his beliefs, and it has a picture of the supervisor holding a T-shirt, and the T-shirt has a picture of another man who, while carrying a picture of something called the white man's Bible, the man had targeted African-American, Jewish, and Asian people in a two-day shooting spree before he shot himself. Okay, now it's not the supervisor who was the shooter. The supervisor is holding a T-shirt that's got a picture of the guy who engaged in the shooting spree. But this employee, your supervisor who's involved in the white supremacist church, he supervises eight employees, three of whom are not white. So you've got two choices. You could say, absolutely untenable to have a supervisor supervising non-white employees where the supervisor publicly espouses such bigotry. He's out of here. Or absolutely untenable to take action against someone at work on the basis of their religious beliefs. All right, quick poll. Who votes option number one? Untenable to have a supervisor supervising non-white employees when they espouse that kind of bigotry. Seriously, all right, untenable. Ida, option number two, untenable to take action against somebody uh, based purely on their religious beliefs. Show of hands. Okay, the supervisor got demoted. They took away his supervisory responsibilities and the company said what? What would you say if you were demoting him? A bunch of you raised your hand. What's the point? John? You're not able to communicate with your subordinates any longer. And as a result, if You're people read that article in the paper, what are, what are the employees going to say? We have no confidence that this person can treat us fairly, right? That's what the company said. He loses his job, and he sues, okay? Who wins this case, the supervisor or the company? Everybody keeping their vote the way they did it, right? Some of you wanted to throw the guy out. Some of you said, got to keep him. And the answer is, the court said, no good. This guy was demoted purely for his beliefs, not because of any act. And the court, threw, court went through this analysis of determining that these were indeed religious beliefs, obnoxious though they may be. Now, we could have a little fun, if time permitted, by changing some of the facts and exploring if they would change the outcome of the case. For example, here it seems like the supervisor did not identify himself to the reporter as being with the company. What if he had? Would that have made a difference? 
to the judge. Could you then take action against that supervisor by saying you, invi- you violated either an express rule in some companies or maybe even an implied obligation not to engage in conduct that's detrimental to the public image of the company, right? Uh, you know, you can have all the religious beliefs you want, but you can't tell the newspaper about it while you're working for us. What if the newspaper had reported that this guy was a supervisor with us, but the employee himself didn't report that information? Let me tell you, lawsuits and the application of important legal principles, they hinge on those kinds of facts, all right? Let's try another one. The editor of a local paper writes an editorial entitled Gay Rights and Wrongs and uh, implicitly compares the civil rights movement of the 1960s with the current gay rights movement. The editor includes in that editorial a protest uh, of a denial of certain health care benefits to same-sex couples at the local university, okay? The local university had denied certain health care benefits to same-sex couples. The writer of the editorial was protesting. Next article, an African-American woman, Ms. D., is the vice president for human uh, resources at the local university, and she responds with an op-ed. She says, her her op-ed is called Gay Rights and Wrongs, Another Perspective. And she rejects the editor's comparison of the civil rights and gay rights movements. And she had a different take on the health care benefits issue. She wrote, I am genetically and biologically a black woman and very pleased to be so as my creator intended. Daily, Thousands of homosexuals make a life decision to leave the gay lifestyle. She identified herself in the op-ed as an alum of the university and as an employee. Next article, the university president chimes in and says, it's common knowledge that Ms. D is the vice president for human resources at the university, but her comments do not accord with the values of the university. What does the university do with Ms. D? They hold a hearing. And she says, those were my private views, and those views did not affect my performance as the vice president for human resources. In fact, she said, I work for people who are believed to be homosexual. I hired one of them. What do you do with Ms. D? You're the university president. Keep her on or fire her? Who wants to keep her on? Somebody other than John. In the back. Tell me why. Gentleman in the back says he doesn't see that she's done anything that would amount to conduct that violates her uh, job responsibilities to the university. Anybody else want to weigh in on behalf of we don't do anything to her? All right. Who wants to take action against this employee? Wait, too many non-voting people in the room. Somebody, who's going who's to take action? I would because she is a representative of the organization and stated her personal views. All right, gentleman says if she wrote without her title, that would be one thing, but she invoked her title in a, a public uh, expression of her opinion, and that means we're, go ahead. She has to represent university policy. If she's going to write something public like that, she didn't, so she's in trouble. University president said, you're gone. President said, the public position you have taken is in direct contradiction to university policies and procedures and core values. It calls into question your ability to lead a critical function within the administration. The result is a loss of confidence in you as an administrator. Well, Ms. D sued, and the court said, by voicing her belief that members of the LGBT community don't possess an immutable characteristic in the way that she as an African a woman, African-American woman does, the implication is clear. She doesn't think LGBT students and employees of the university are entitled to civil rights protections, even though the university, through her department, openly, uh, expressly provides for them. 
summary judgment for the university affirmed. And I ask, was that about conduct or belief? Let's try another one. The company displays what they call diversity posters uh, around the workplace. It's part of a diversity campaign. And the posters show pictures of company employees with captions like you know, black, blonde, old, Hispanic, and gay. Well, one employee says that uh, the homosexual activities violate biblical commandments and that he has a duty to expose evil when confronted with sin. This employee puts up posters in his cubicle with biblical, biblical quotes, such as from Leviticus, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Okay, his supervisors confer, and they decide these posters are offensive or could be offensive to some employees, and that they violated the diversity policy. Policy says it's unacceptable to engage in conduct relating to sexual orientation that fails to respect the dignity and feelings of another person. Okay, what follows is a bunch of meetings. They share their views, the employee and management. The employee said the biblical passages that he quoted were intended to be hurtful. That probably wasn't the smartest thing he said during the discussions. But he said, I, I, I think this employee genuinely believed it because he said, because otherwise you cannot correct people's behavior. He also said he thought the diversity campaign was an effort to target Christian fundamentalists. How about a compromise here? It's always a smart idea to think about a compromise. Well, the employee proposed a compromise. What did he say? Yeah, he said, I'll take down mine if you take down yours. Or you leave yours up, I leave my posters up. If you were the company, what would you say? In the back. Take it down. Take it down. He's got to take his down without regard to what the company does? Okay, he says, let's both take them down. He could live with that. You're the company. Is that acceptable? I see a head shaking no. Tell me why. Right. The comment for those on the webinar is this is a cubicle in the company's workspace. It would be different if he did it someplace else. Question, would it be different if he said it to a reporter in an article that got published in a local paper? Or we won't go there. Right? In this instance, the company said no. Right? They gave him time off to, uh, with pay to think about it. He came back. He refused to take down the posters. What happens next? What happens next is what happens to everybody in these stories. He got fired, and he sued. And he said... This is religious discrimination, right? You didn't give me a reasonable accommodation. People prepared to rule? Who wins? Who votes the employee's got a claim for religious discrimination? Tell me why. So you always have to do the why question afterwards. It's a terrible thing. But we did give, we did give you lunch, so it's okay. <laughs> employee wins. Tell me why. Okay, we have, it be, we have a judge taking the question under advisement, as we say in the uh, law and judging business. Anybody else want to take a shot? Who says company wins? For reasons previously stated or roughly, yes. All right, and the answer is the court said the company need not accommodate this guy if doing so would result in discrimination against the rights of others, nor does the company need to allow him to impose his religious beliefs on others. What about that idea of taking all the posters down? And the court said, I, this was very important, I thought, the court said that that would have inflicted undue hardship on the company because the company has the right to promote tolerance and diversity. I think that's important because it elevates promoting tolerance and diversity into the realm of a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for doing what the company did. And that's very helpful to those who have to draft and enforce such policies. Let's try one more. The employee works for the uh, Federal Centers for Disease Control. And the CDC has an employee assistance program Ms. W. gets hired to work as an EAP counselor for the CDC, and she agrees to be bound by the EAP guidelines about uh, diversity and inclusion. Ms. W. says she's a devout Christian 
who believes it's immoral to engage in same-sex sexual relationships. She believes her religion prohibits her from encouraging or supporting same-sex relationships through counseling, meaning she can counsel an individual gay or lesbian employee, but in her view, she may not provide relationship counseling to employees who are gay or lesbian in a same-sex relationship. So uh, she had referred a gay client to an outside counselor. She talked to her supervisor about her religious objections. And afterwards, a CDC employee comes to her for counseling. And the employee says that uh, she, the employee, has been in a same-sex relationship for 18 years, and she wants to talk to Ms., uh, Ms. W about issues that have come up between her and her same-sex partner. And Ms. W says, she couldn't provide the counseling because of her personal values. She didn't even say religious beliefs. She said personal values, and she referred this employee to a colleague. Well, that employee went and complained to her supervisor. She said that she felt that her relationship was being disapproved of by Ms. W. She felt judged and condemned. So the supervisor goes and talks to Ms. W, and the supervisor tells Ms. W, you know, that employee, client of yours, who you referred away, she called you homophobic. And Ms. W said, you know, I can counsel the individuals, but I can't counsel somebody about a same-sex relationship. So the supervisor says, next time this comes up, why don't you just tell the person that you're inexperienced with relationship counseling? Don't talk about your personal views. And Ms. W says, well, that would be lying. Right? CDC higher official learns about this and says, you know, I'm concerned about the manner in which, in which Ms. W stated her objections because she wound up making an employee feel worse. What do you do with Ms. W? She stays, she goes. Who says she stays? Who says she goes? Why? Counseling people is a core responsibility of her job. She can't do it. Who said she stayed? There were a bunch of hands. Tell me why. Ah, so it's saying she can't stay means anybody who holds that religious belief is not qualified for the position. She sued. She lost. The court said she wasn't fired for a religious belief. She was fired for the way she interacted with a client, and there was a concern that she would do it again in the future, namely mistreating the patient, making the patient feel judged, is not part of a religious belief. The court says you can curb the non-religious part of somebody's behavior. All right, so what? So what, what does this all mean for you and your workplaces? This is hard. There's conduct, there's belief, and the lines are not what we would like them to be between the two. We cannot always clarify this lack of clarity between the two, but there are some things that we can do. We can attempt to communicate with our employees as issues arise. First, is there, never mind is it conduct or belief, we certainly want to start with that, but then, is there a real conflict? If there is, can it be accommodated? And then, do you have a mechanism that your employees have been told about for them to bring their concerns to you just like people know what to do if they have a complaint about harassment or discrimination of other kinds. And lastly, are your people trained to know what to do with these kinds of complaints? To my ears, the most painful part of any of the stories that I shared with you is when Mr. B's company said to him, we're not interested in any philosophical discussions. Why have those discussions? I think first and foremost, it's a matter of respect. Right? Even if employees are going to disagree with us, let them be able to say, I was heard, and to that extent I was treated with respect. But also, these discussions at least sometimes are going to reveal that there is less to the dispute than meets the eye. In the case of Mr. B, 
you know, further discussion surely would have helped him to understand that there wasn't really a conflict between his concerns and the company policy. You'll notice that several of these stories have to do with the interface between religion and LGBT issues. Uh, and since now it will require a higher intelligence to discuss those issues, I'll stop talking and hand it off to Todd Horn. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Todd Horn. Um, I grew up in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in western Virginia, and my ma and pa told me that when you're in mixed company, you never speak of matters of sex or religion. Well, clearly my friend Doug has no respect for my parents' rules, <laughs> and fortunately for you, neither do I. The law regarding the rights of LGBT employees began about 25 years ago, and it has developed very rapidly in the last couple years. And one of the best ways, as we just saw, uh, to learn about your organization's compliance obligations and uh, risk issues, risk factors, is to examine scenarios that may exist in the modern nonprofit workplace. So let's look at a couple. So consider, if you will, Joe, one of your employees, is straight. He comes to you and complains that Walt, who also is straight, privately makes comments about his body and his sex lives and things of that nature, and it bothers Joe. Is that a problem? We'll see. Consider, if you will, Loretta from your marketing department announces to you that his name is now Larry leaves your office and goes into the men's room. Is that a problem? We'll see. There's another one for you to consider. Hank from accounting comes to work in a mini skirt and full makeup. He does not shave his beard. He's scheduled to make a presentation to your board that morning. Is that a problem? You're going to like that one. Lastly, Joanne presents herself at work as a straight woman. One day her supervisor sees her in a restaurant in a different town holding hands with and kissing another woman. The, Margaret, the supervisor, comes back and tells coworkers that uh, Joanne is a lesbian. Is that a problem? All right. Well, before we jump into the law, in these scenarios, let's, get, let's go over some terminology. And in general, the laws that we're going to discuss protect employees on the basis of their sexual orientation and gender identity. And these are clearly different concepts, but everyone, or almost everyone, has both. The first one, sexual orientation, is the, is the easiest one. It's an individual's physical or psychological or emotional attraction to the same or opposite gender. And these actually give us the initials of the, uh, of, the, of the topic, lesbian, gay, bisexual, heterosexual does not get a letter. The second concept is gender identity. And, and you've got to really separate this in your mind. This is a person's innate, deep, psychological identification of being either male or female. And the critical feature here is it may not conform or correspond to their biology or the gender they were assigned at birth. It's how they view themselves. Next is uh, gender expression. Gender expression is the manner in which a person publicly displays masculinity or fem femininity. It's, it's simply how uh, someone looks, acts, and dresses, their hair, their clothes, their jewelry, their makeup. Uh, it includes uh, the way they talk, the way they move. Um, it, it may be an expression of gender identity, but not always, because some transgendered folks are closeted. And remember, sexual orientation is distinct from, from gender identity. Uh, next is transgender person. This is a person 
whose gender identity, how they view themselves, is different from their biological sex or their sex that they were assigned at birth. Now, this is not always a binary question. It is not always that person is a man or male, or excuse me, a man or a woman, because it is a function often of gender stereotypes. So consider this at one extreme. You have a man that comes to work who's wearing an earring, okay? Is that person a transgendered person, okay? Look at the other end of the spectrum where someone um, is, is, is undergoing gender assignment surgery or hormone therapy, okay? You can see how everywhere in between there we have a spectrum of, um, a spectrum that's really hard to, to put your finger on. And, and it also involves issues of self-awareness because many times transgendered folks face internal conflicts about themselves, how they really identify themselves because they may uh, they may fear persecution, discrimination, or, or, other, or other issues. So they just may not know. And the statistics actually bear that out. So let's talk about those for a second. Oh, by the way, did you all know that 82.7% of all statistics are made up on the spot? <laughs> the Department of uh, Health and Human Services did a survey a couple years ago where they uh, interviewed a large segment of the adult population and asked them what their sexual orientation was. Based upon the data, about 5 million adults self-identified as gay or lesbian, about 2 million as bisexual, and about 3.5 million, 1% per, or so, said they didn't know what their sexual orientation was, or it was something other than gay or lesbian, or none of your business. They didn't answer. And that's, that goes into the, the ambiguity I, I referenced a few minutes ago. Um, Transgender statistics, there are no reliable uh, formal statistics on that. Because, and plus, we have, we have the definitional problem we just talked about. Many folks are not out, and therefore, they're not going to volunteer the information. But the estimates are it's, it's a significant part of the population by numbers uh, from, from a million to, to several million. Let's talk about the law a little bit. Title VII, as you know, is the primary law that prohibits employment discrimination, race, gender, religion, national origin. Title VII, and no other federal law, um, prohibits expressly discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity to private sector employers. And as a result, courts have historically rejected claims of employees who said, I'm being discriminated against because of my sexual orientation or gender identity. About 20 years ago, the Supreme Court issued some decisions under Title VII, which have served as the foundation for the sea change here. Um, in one case, the Supreme Court held that sex harassment violates Title VII, even if the harasser and the victim are the same sex. The second case, uh, the court held that um, the, the gender stereotyping is a form of sex discrimination. In that case, a woman partner of accounting firm was told, you need to act more femininely. You need to dress like a woman, act more like a woman, talk more like a woman, wear makeup, jewelry, and things of that nature. And the court said that type of conduct can violate Title VII. And since then, the EEOC and many lower courts have said, as a result, gender stereotyping can be used to give a cause of action under Title VII to uh, to employees who are, who are subject to discrimination. It doesn't cover them because of their gender identity or sexual orientation. It covers them because of, of those underlying issues. Um, and earlier this year, President Obama signed an executive order which did expressly prohibit uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity for government contractors. We also have about 20 states in the District of Columbia that have specific statutes that prohibit that type of discrimination. There are dozens of local ordinances that uh, prohibit that, and there are new ones every day. So this, this is probably going to uh, apply to virtually every nonprofit organization in, in a few years. The laws do vary at the, uh, at the fringes, but they generally cover all aspects of the employment relationship, from hiring to termination and everything in between, promotions, demotions, discipline, termination, 
environment claims, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute or two. The remedies can be very steep, very painful, and very expensive for violations. They range from reinstatement, if the person has been fired, you've got to bring them back, uh, money, back pay, lost benefits, emotional distress, that's if someone has uh, uh, loss of enjoyment of life, suffering, things of that nature, they can get money for it, punitive damages in particularly egregious cases, and attorney's fees. And of course, if you lose, you have the privilege of not only paying your attorney, you have to pay the other side's attorney too. So these are expensive cases. Um, environment claims play a prominent role in this type of, uh, in this type of law. Um, environment claims are shorthand for hostile work environment, and that's where someone has been subjected to severe and outrageous, uh, pervasive, abusive conduct because of a protected status. Um, it can exist as a freestanding claim, and it's almost always included as evidence to support an, a claim of, dis, of discrimination. And we have the full spectrum in the, in the types of cases that we see. Uh, on, on one hand, we have overt harassment, which is slurs, jokes, uh, pranks, disrespectful nicknames, teasing and mocking of appearance and mannerisms. Um, in the transgender area, you always see where uh, colleagues are purposely calling them by their former name or misusing he or she. And in the more extreme cases, it, it involves physical violence uh, or threats. Um, we also always see subtle actions. And these are actions that the managers may not even be aware they're doing. Uh, they may be unintentional. Um, but they're very, they're very uh, clear and obvious to the person that's being subjected to them. Ostracization, being ignored, um, questioning or interrogating about the, the transitioning process, denial of mentoring or training, limiting customer contact because you fear that you're going to lose business by them. Uh, and also dress code, dress code enforcement and restroom assignments. Um, so what do we do? What, what, are the, what are the ways in which we can minimize the risk of lawsuits under these laws? The, the, most of them are very easy. Number one is you change your policies. You modify your policies to reflect the changes in the laws. And it's simple as everywhere where you have your EEO commitment, your handbook, your advertisements, uh, your, your applications include LBGD issues, okay? Um, make sure your complaint procedure is specifically modified so that if you have an LBGT employee who feels that they are being harassed or discriminated against, they have a mechanism by which that they can complain and bring it forward to you and get resolution. Um, dress codes, uh, et cetera, that's where you, you, know, you, you may have to, 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 to kind of do it on the fly as circumstances present yourself. Because remember, we're dealing with a spectrum of issues in many cases. Um, the next part of it is to train the staff and management about these policies and practices. Uh, it's, part of it is making sure they understand the law. Part of it's also just sensitivity to make sure that they're aware of, of the types of circumstances that some employees may uh, bring to the workplace and not to feel awkward or uncomfortable about it because that can sometimes itself make things worse and, and create claims. Um, if a person does complain, uh, you want to have make sure prompt action is taken. Uh, and this would include not only a formal complaint, but if you hear something, uh, if you see something, um, you don't want to put your head in the stand and ignore it. You want to have it investigated. You want to take remedial action so it doesn't happen again. And of course, like everything, document the process and consult legal counsel if necessary. All right, now, what about Joe? Remember Joe? Joe was the one who came to you and said that uh, Walt has been uh, subjecting him to uh, you know, inappropriate comments. Is that a problem? Well, yes, we know that because several years ago, the Supreme Court said that same-sex harassment violates the law, and that is irrespective of a person's uh, gender identity or sexual orientation. So any type of, of abusive conduct at work that, has, uh, that is unwelcome and based, is based on a person's gender 
is going to violate the law and create problems. And that's where you really want to make sure your investigative process is, is up to speed and vibrant. Uh, next is Loretta. Remember Loretta. She is the one that came to you and said, my name's now, I'm now a he, my name's now Larry, and then stormed into the men's room. Okay. This is a sensitive issue. Um, it, it appears in a lot of the cases that we face. And it creates uh, all kinds of challenges for workforces, especially if they have sex-segregated uh, restroom facilities. The bottom line is, and I'll note there, there are going to be exceptions in different circumstances, but the bottom line is a nonprofit should allow an employee to use the facility that corresponds to their gender presentation, okay, regardless of what stage in the transition process they're in. So this is, this is not an issue with sexual orientation. It, it's an issue with, with transgendered employees. And the example I gave you, I wanted it to be as blunt as possible, uh, that, that it was merely a name change and nothing else. Um, but if that person has a genuine self-identity of being a man now, then yes, it would, be, it would be risky to say you cannot use a men's room. But there are other ways to deal with it. You can, you can have um, unisex facilities with locks, things of that nature. So there are ways to, to, to deal with it. Um, Hank. Remember, Hank is the guy that came to work with a full beard, miniskirt, makeup, has a presentation to the board that morning. Do you let him make the presentation to the board? Well, this one depends. This has a lot of, of tricky nuances, and the issues are not easy. So on one extreme, let's say he's just doing it as a goof or he's going to a, a costume party, okay? Well, absolutely not. Under no circumstances would he... Make, be allowed to make a presentation on, on, on that or because of that. Um, what if he is uh, a genuinely transitioning employee from male to female and he's publicly displaying as a female, notwithstanding the beard? Well, in that case, yes, you probably should allow the presentation to take place. Um, and then the third one is, the third possibility is, uh, Hank is not a transgender person. He is a male who self-identifies as a male but merely likes to wear women's clothes, okay? The, a, a classic cross-dresser. In that situation, under the law, you would not have to allow him because he's not being excluded because of his gender identity. He's being excluded because, well, it's, it's, it probably violates your dress code, okay? He's not presenting as a woman He's, he's a man who's dressing like a woman. And I know that it may seem, uh, it may seem like a, a very subtle difference, but, but it, 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 is, uh, it is a distinction. And lastly, uh, Mar Margaret outing Joanne as being lesbian. Um, that can create serious invasion of privacy issues for Joanne. Obviously, it's going to depend on more than the facts I just gave you, but uh, if, if Joanne is going out of her way to, to stay closeted, um, and just happens to, uh, you know, Margaret has just happens to see her in a distant city, and Margaret's a supervisor and is doing this at work, it can create problems for you that uh, hopefully she, um, she should know better about. All right, we'll have questions at the end, but let me turn this over to, uh, to Keith. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, now we're done with the heavy lifting, and we're going to go to the lighter topic of employee benefits and qualified retirement plans. So, but uh, anyway, I really appreciate uh, everybody participating in today's webinar today. I know this is a very busy time of the year, and um, so we really appreciate that. The, the bright side is, is that we had a, a sunny day today, um, and I was born in Buffalo, so even though it's cold out there, this is a bright and sunny day, so we, we enjoy that. But anyway... Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, employee benefits aspects of uh, um, LBGT issues, and um, I'm going to generally cover uh, two topics. Uh, one is uh, the overall employee benefits for same gender um, spouses, and the second topic is going to be uh, uh, benefit implications of gender reassignment surgery. So we'll, we'll go into that. There have been significant developments. Um, with respect to uh, employee benefits for same-gender spouses 
uh, primarily because of a Supreme Court case uh, last June, uh, or June 2013, uh, U.S. v. Windsor. And that case addressed the constitutionality of the Defense of Marriage Act. So, what is the Defense of Marriage Act? That was enacted in um, 1996. Um, believe it or not, it was uh, signed into law by uh, President Clinton uh, less than two months before uh, his second term election there. And um, uh, he's since distanced himself from that. And um, uh, But at the time, there were political uh, you know, reasons for him, him signing that legislation. But I know people are always a little surprised when they hear the, 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 the timing of that. That law, but it, it essentially does two things. Uh, first, it, it allowed states to refuse to recognize same gender marriages performed under the laws of another state. That was section two of DOMA. And then uh, the second uh, part, uh, which was section three, it defined marriage for federal law purposes um, as including only a legal union between one man and one woman. So, and just to put that in historical perspective, you know, traditionally, um, you know, the um, definition and regulation of marital status is generally um, reserved to the states. So that was a significant sort of change. But again, DOMA was only with respect to um, for federal law purposes. Um, United States v. Windsor, as I mentioned, that was decided uh, June 26, 2013. Um, and the Supreme Court declared Section 3 of DOMA uh, unconstitutional as violating the Equal Protection Clause. Um, it did not address Section 2. So Section 3, again, was the, the provision that basically said for federal purposes, uh, marriage included only uh, a marriage between a man and a woman. Um, just as far as background, Windsor involved uh, the federal estate tax and it involved um, uh, uh, two women that were married, one passed away, and the second attempted to claim the uh, marital marital exemption for federal state tax purposes, which would have saved her uh, close to $400,000 in uh, estate tax. And she was denied by the IRS. And the uh, um, court basically held that, uh, you know, that was in violation. The, the definition of spouse that they used was pursuant to uh, Section 3 of, of DOMA. Um, now, at the time that Windsor was decided, um, there were more than 200 um, federal in, uh, income tax code sections and regulations that refer to the term spouse, just to kind of put it in perspective. Um, currently, state laws, there's um, 35 uh, states plus the District of Columbia that uh, currently uh, authorize uh, same gender marriages, and there's 15 states that currently do not. And an important point on this slide is the date, as of 12 4 um, 2014, that changes very quickly. Um, when Windsor was decided in June of 2013, there were only 12 states that uh, uh, same gender marriages were legal in. Uh, retirement plan implications. And when I'm talking about retirement plans, I'm referring to qualified retirement plans primarily in 403B plans, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. But there are requirements in the code and in uh, parts of ERISA that require um, uh, certain benefits be provided through those plans to spouses. And now with the Windsor decision, spouses include both um, same gender marriages and opposite gender marriages. And an example, this is a list of, of implications for qualified retirement plans, but the first one deals with uh, survivor annuities. Qualified retirement plans are, to the extent someone's married at the date of death, have specific provisions that uh, require benefits um, death benefits be provided to spouses. Um, there's consent rights if you're trying to elect a different form. Um, there's rollover rights. There's favorable rollover rights for um, spouses. Quadro rights, qualified domestic relations ordering. So that's the list. So there's significant implications to the meaning of spouse. Um, health and welfare implications. Um, most of these deal with sort of tax treatment of benefits provided to, to spouses. But uh, before Windsor, if they cover the same um, gender spouse, uh, if a plan covered the same gender spouse or medical plan, those benefits would be taxable to the, the same gender spouse. And now 
uh, they're, they're no longer taxable. Um, and there's other implications on this on this slide here. Uh, for example, special enrollment rights, uh, COBRA implications to, to, to this new definition. Um, but what I wanted to emphasize on this slide is, is that unlike uh, retirement plan implications, there's no specific requirement that there be that the uh, uh, same gender spouses actually be covered by health and welfare plans. And so that's, a, that's an important distinction. Uh, there was a recent um, case in New York District Court where they addressed um, you know, covering um, same gender spouses in a medical plan. And the court concluded that there's no federal requirement. This particular plan um, was a self-insured plan, and that was uh, an important factor in that case because self-insured plans are, um, are uh, uh, covered by the ERISA preemption provision, and that meant that state laws uh, are generally preempted. And so if this plan had been a fully insured plan, then those plans would have generally been required to uh, comply with state law. And as uh, Todd mentioned, um, there's 20 states plus the District of Columbia right now that <coughs> include uh, anti-discrimination laws with respect to uh, sexual orientation. So if you have a fully insured plan, uh, that court case may not be controlling. Um, <coughs> the IRS came out with uh, some guidance after the Windsor decision. This, this, uh, they came out with the IRS Revenue Ruling 2013-17. And uh, they basically addressed the question after Windsor you know, sort of what state law applies. And this was particularly relevant in a situation where someone is residing in a state that doesn't recognize same-gender marriages, but they were uh, either went to another state to get married that did recognize or they had moved from, from a state. And so the question is, is, is it the place of celebration or the place of domicile? And the um, IRS said for federal tax purposes, we're going to adopt the place of celebration rule. And again, they essentially rejected the place of domicile rule, which would have been very difficult to um, administer because if they had adopted the place of domicile rule, every time someone moved, they could have had a change in marital status for benefits purposes. So that would have been a nightmare. Um, let's see here. Let's go to the next slide. Um, let's move on here. This is just some more detail here in the interest of time. We'll kind of go to uh, slide 53. Um, the IRS came out with some additional guidance in April of this year uh, to address the specific implications of the Windsor decision to qualified and 403B plans. And uh, they clarified that uh, retirement plans uh, generally had to begin operating in compliance with Windsor as of June 26, 2013, which is the uh, date of the Supreme Court decision, the Windsor decision. Um, they also clarified that plans could have recognized uh, same-gender spouses before June 26. Uh, before the date of the decision. Um, and plans could do that uh, for all purposes or just for selected purposes. And then they also clarified from June 26, 2013, the date of the decision until September 16, 2013, when they came out with uh, their guidance, their first guidance, they said that a plan can apply either a place of celebration or place of domicile rule. But after September 16, 2013, you have to, going forward, you have to apply the place of celebration rule. So that was clarification for qualified retirement plans and 403B plans. Um, plan amendments, uh, also address plan amendments. And this one is relevant for this month because uh, qualified retirement plans are required essentially to be amended by the end of this month to be in compliance with the Windsor decision. So we'll, we'll point that out. But they uh, clarified that uh, plans generally have to be amended by the end of this year in two cases one of which is that the plan's terms, the current plan terms are inconsistent with the Windsor decision. For example, the plan expressly defines uh, a spouse as including only uh, a marriage between a man and a woman. Um, that plan has to be amended by the end of this year. Uh, the second situation where a plan has to be amended by the end of this year is when the plan chooses to apply the Windsor decision prior to June 26, 2013. They, they're requiring that plans go in for amendments there. Now, as part of that guidance, even though if your plan doesn't fit within any of those two categories, you technically don't have to amend the plan, the IRS did encourage um, employers to include clarifying amendments. So even if your plan is not inconsistent or you didn't apply Windsor before June 26, uh, they're encouraging that, and we're also recommending that as well. Um, 
as I mentioned, the next bullet, um, the required amendments have to be done by the end of this year generally. Um, and I just want to emphasize that 403B plans are not required to be amended uh, by the end of this year. Um, they don't have to be amended until the IRS issues additional guidance with respect to deadline. So that's, that's an important point. 403B plans, just for those uh, that may not be familiar with those, they're uh, tax favored plans similar to qualified retirement plans that can only be maintained by uh, 501c3 and certain educational organizations. Um, family and Medical Leave Act implications, uh, FMLA, uh, provides certain leave rights to eligible um, employees. Um, that included a definition of spouse um, as well. Now, when Windsor was first enacted, uh, the Department of Labor, which enforces FMLA, um, came out with uh, its guidance, and it actually adopted um, a place of domicile rule. And as I mentioned before, that's a a difficult rule to administer because you can change your marital status just by moving your residence. Um, they've recently, on June 20th, 2014, they've um, issued a proposed rule that would change that uh, prospectively so that they would adopt the place of celebration rule on a going forward basis. And so um, I'll have to continue to monitor that. Um, it's proposed form right now. Uh, I'd also like to point out that um, employers can be more favorable so that even though you know they originally adopted the place of domicile, uh, you could adopt that currently if, if you like, just from an administrative perspective if you haven't already done that. Um, action steps. Um, just kind of walk through what you should be doing if you haven't already done, done this at this point. Um, you can check plan documents and SPDs to see if you know definition of spouse needs to be changed. We, we mentioned you know the, the requirement for qualified plans that you have to in certain cases. Um, there's really no requirement that you seek out information about an employee's marital, marital status, um, but you know, we recommend that you consider um, you know, sending out a reminder to people to keep it up to date and in touch if you haven't already done that. Um, you can check your other communications, open enrollment. Um, you can stop imputing income if you haven't. Again, you should have already uh, started doing this, but you can look through stop imputing income, you know, same gender marriages with respect to, um, you know, certain benefits that were taxable in the past. And then you should just look at your FMLA policy um, to make sure that it's been updated at this point. Um, you can, uh, and then uh, the final point I just want to emphasize here is that to continue to monitor, you know, this area of the law for changes because it's rapidly evolving. I mentioned, uh, you know, the number of states that recognize same-gender marriages is now at 35, and there's lots of litigation pending, and there's lots of guidance that we're expecting to still receive from the government regarding this issue. Um, second topic I want to discuss, and see if um, we're getting close to when we wanted to stop for, for questions. Second topic I wanted to um, discuss was, uh, was health care coverage for gender reassignment surgery. And I um, wanted to mention first, there was a tax court case back in 2010, Don and Payne, uh, the commissioner, where they addressed uh, whether or not expenses incurred for gender reassignment surgery and hormone therapy um, to treat uh, gender identity disorder uh, were deductible for tax purposes. And they ultimately concluded that it was. And uh, in order to be deductible, they had to conclude that uh, gender uh, identity disorder is a disease and that uh, those um, treatments, gender reassignment surgery and hormone therapy, are medically necessary and they concluded in both cases that they are. And so that was, was a decision. Um, and it has implications from a, a tax perspective, clearly. I um, wanted to emphasize, though, that there currently are no federal laws that require employer-provided health plans um, cover gender reassignment surgery. and so. Um, that's, that's still an issue. If a plan uh, doesn't expressly address that issue, then there's, there's some issues that we'll talk about here in a moment. But I um, wanted to mention that there's uh, several states that uh, have adopted specific laws, and I mentioned the states there, that uh, prevent or prohibit categorical exclusions of uh, uh, transition-related care. And so uh, I mentioned earlier the distinction between self-insured medical plans Oh, I'm sorry. I, I mentioned earlier the um, distinction between self-insured medical plans and insured medical plans, and um, self-insured medical plans are, are subject to the ERISA preemption provision, so therefore 
um, state laws are generally pro preempted, whereas insured plans are not. And so, you know, uh, if you're looking at the design of your plan um, and you have an insured plan, there's different considerations that you have to uh, work through than in a, a self-insured plan. Um, there is a trend, more plans are expressly covering gender reassignment, uh, surgery, and other transition procedures at this point. Um, there's quite a few um, employers that are trying to stay on the cutting edge of designs, and, um, and this is one where you know, plans want to reach out and cover these types of expenses and make, make it absolutely clear in the plan document. Um, even in those plans where they do cover that, um, there's issues um, remain about what is medically necessary um, versus cosmetic. <coughs> when you're going through the, the, the transition process there. And so you can still, even if an employer makes a decision that they want to add that to their plan, there's still issues. Um, with respect to the other plans that either um, you know, are silent or, or they exclude such coverage, um, there's uh, you know, issues there as well. And one is if the plan doesn't exclude such coverage, it's the uh, extent to which such procedures are covered. If your plan has language in there that says it only covers medically necessary, um, you know, treatments, that raises the question whether uh, these types of procedures would be covered. Um, the Donna Behave case uh, would be guidance, but that was uh, a decision for federal tax purposes, and so it wouldn't necessarily control for plan interpretation purposes. Um, there's potential exclusions, um, you know, based on experimental, that they, you know, some of these procedures may be experimental because they're not proven. Uh, and then there's also uh, denials based on that these are cosmetic or for appearance purposes only. So, again, this is an issue um, that's evolving and one that would require you to monitor very closely. So, with that, I will uh, stop and turn it back over to Jeff. Uh, Keith, there's a question from the webinar asking, um, are there any unique uh, rules or applications to, uh, to what you talk about with respect to faith-based organizations? Well, there, there are the, the uh, all with respect to these requirements for retirement plans. It's the Hobby Lobby case that uh, uh, was decided uh, earlier this year um, that basically uh, recognized exceptions for um, certain mandated benefits, and they would apply, or arguably would apply in this context to the extent that there would be uh, mandated benefits in the future. So there's clearly uh, implications from, from that perspective. Okay, with that, we'll open it up to um, questions from anyone here in the room or on the webinar for any of our speakers. Anyone have any questions on anything that we've talked about today? And if you could uh, just wait a sec for the microphone, that'd be great. Good afternoon. Uh, my association deals with schools, private schools, and we have uh, students who are transgender and are seeking to use the restroom uh, and locker room of the gender that they uh, identify themselves as. The school is thinking about doing that. Would that create a problem with the rights, say, if, if you have a biological male using a female locker room for the rights of the young women in the locker room? Well, uh, you're somewhat out of my expertise because that's more of a school issue and rights of minors, which are generally not addressed in these employment statutes. I can tell you we do have here at Vulnerable folks who specialize in, in, in school uh, representation, particularly private schools as well, uh, who deal with these issues, and we can certainly hook you up with them to get a, a, an answer. But I would, I would I'd be going out of limb to try to speculate on that. Other questions? Well, hearing none, I want to thank uh, our speakers for a, a terrific job on today's program. Uh, I also want to um, um, let you know that uh, the recording of uh, today's program will be uh, posted on um, Venable's uh, YouTube channel tomorrow. Uh, you can see the link here on this uh, final slide where we have the recordings of all of our monthly 
seminars and webinars on nonprofit legal topics. Uh, and you can also find uh, links there to all of our online resources, articles, PowerPoint presentations on a very wide array of uh, nonprofit legal topics. Uh, feel free to access that information at any time. Obviously, feel free to follow up with myself or any of our speakers with questions you may have after the fact. And otherwise, thank you very much for participating. Hope you guys have a wonderful holiday, and we'll see you back here hopefully in January. Thank you.